मानुषी संवाद में आप सबका स्वागत है वेलकम टू द ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट अप्रैल 2024 एडिशन ऑफ मानुषी संवाद व्यूअर्स आज एक थोड़ा लकीर से हटकर टॉपिक है और वो है आपने पढ़ तो लिया ही है द चैलेंज ऑफ शादिया इन द वेस्ट इसका बैकग्राउंड इसकी भूमिका मैं कुछ आपको बता दूं कि इस साल 2024 में 8 मार्च यानी विमेंस इंटरनेशनल डे के दिन हमने आ, राहुल सूर हैं न्यूयॉर्क में उनके इनिशिएटिव पर कई लोगों ने मिलकर फर्स्ट ऑफ इट्स काइंड पिटिशन टू द यूएन ह्यूमन राइट्स काउंसिल सबमिट की ये जो कंप्लेंट थी हमारी करीब 80 लोगों ने साइन की ये यूएन ह्यूमन राइट्स काउंसिल पे अभी तक अक्सर क्या होता है कि हमारे इंडिया के खिलाफ पाकिस्तान कभी जा रहा है कोई इस्लामी मुल्क जा रहा है इत्यादि इत्यादि तरह तरह के हिंदू विरोधी ताकत ताकतें जाती रहती हैं यूएन हमें वहाँ से लताड़ डलवाने के लिए वहाँ से हमारे खिलाफ रेजोल्यूशंस पास कराने के लिए परंतु ये आ, कम होता है कि हिंदुस्तान में से सिटीजन्स जाएं और आ, हिंदुस्तान को गाली दिलवाने के लिए नहीं लेकिन अपने बचाव के लिए कोई पटिशन डाली जाए पर ये केवल इंडिया की पटिशन नहीं है ये पटिशन जो है इसमें कई सारे देशों के लोगों ने सिग्नेचर अपने दिए हैं और इसमें पुरुष भी हैं स्त्रियां भी हैं इसमें 80 सिग्नेटरीज जो हैं वो 15 देशों से हैं इंक्लूडिंग यूएसए कैनेडा जर्मनी यूके डेनमार्क इसराइल ऑस्ट्रेलिया इंडिया ईरान साउथ अफ्रीका युगांडा रशिया ऑस्ट्रिया फिलीपींस एंड नेदरलैंड्स इनमें पैंतीस स्त्रियां हैं और चौवालीस पुरुष हैं और इनमें कई सारे हम भारत से भी लोग हैं जिनमें बहुत सी प्रोमिनेंट स्त्रियां भी सिग्नेटरीज हैं तो ये जो पटिशन हमने डाली है इनकी एक सिग्नेटरी आज हमारे साथ जुड़ रही हैं वो हैं लेजली लेबल उनसे मैं आपका परिचय कराती हूँ वेलकम टू टू द मानुषी इंडिया चैनल लेजली जी ये पटिशन हटा दो या वेलकम लेजली I was just I was just explaining to our viewers that uh, the background for this petition to which you are one of the prominent signatories so am I and I thought uh, we we'll ask you to explain number 1 uh, what is it that prompted you to do it uh, you're an ex diplomat you have worked in several countries uh uh and as well as in the un now what is it that prompted you to sign this petition i uh as you say spent many years as a diplomat can you hear me can you hear yes, me yes please yes please okay i I spent many years as a diplomat and during those years we talked about many many different important political and economic issues and never once did we talk about the problem of the rights of women specifically uh violations of international rights that were ascribed to sharia so after I retired I began to do research on it and it just seemed to me as a problem that was very important and not at all recognized and to give a little bit of background i'm an american and as everybody knows the question of slavery was very important to white as well as to black people because if you have people who are not, not given their rights under the law your rights are also damaged 
And it seemed to me that if there were women, mostly Muslim women, but not uniquely, women living in the United States that were not given the rights that we had earned and been given in law, then that damages me as well as it damages them. So that's a little bit of my background. And I simply kept looking into it. I had lived in Europe for many years. And these questions are much more acute in Europe because the established Muslim enclaves are much more prominent. And that's where many of these violations apparently occur. So that's why I wrote my book. I wanted to inform the average American who's busy with his or her life about this problem. So that's why I did it. I, I can't hear you. If you have a copy of your book, would you like to show it to our viewers? But of course. Yes, we have, of course, uh, put it in the description. Yeah, Here, it's written there. struggle, the challenge of Sharia in the West. Am I right? Hidden struggle, the challenge of Sharia in the West. Correct. Now, why do you call it the hidden struggle? Because most people don't see it. For example, it's well known that if you are living in a community, let's say you came to an arranged marriage from a foreign country, you really don't speak the, the language of the country, whether it's European or American, you don't speak it very well. You are dependent on the people in your community. So if something goes wrong, you're not exactly going to run to the media and talk about it. You're not even going to talk to somebody like me who is a sympathetic outsider. It's a hidden struggle because it's not, it doesn't get in the news very often. Uh, there are powerful voices such as those associated with the Muslim Brotherhood that will immediately attack anybody who does try to talk about it. And therefore, it's, uh, it, it, nobody knows. It's a hidden struggle. But whose struggle are you referring to? Are you referring to the struggle of Muslim women against Islam or Western societies trying to protect themselves from the onslaught of Islam? I wish I were talking about the latter because the struggle actually is not just Muslim women who may have a problem that they cannot, they, they don't see a way to solve. But there is also, as I detail in my book, a longstanding effort by Islamist groups, and I choose the Muslim Brotherhood because it is so prominent, who wish to establish a global caliphate under Sharia law. And that requires dismantling the US Constitution and American law. This sounds outrageous to the average American and absurd, but that doesn't mean that somebody isn't trying to do it. And the people who are trying to do it make no secret. And in my book, I can cite them. Uh, yes, so I've read, so I couldn't read the book because I couldn't access it from the link that you provided, but I read some of your articles and we will discuss mm -hmm. some of the issues that you have raised in your uh, papers published in academic journals. I would also like you to talk briefly about the organization you are a part of, namely Clarity, which is Champions for Liberty Against the Reality of Islamist Tyranny. How did yes. that come about? It came about because I had sent to uh, <coughs> Ali, I had sent her a copy of my book, hoping that perhaps somebody that she knew could review it. Of course, I sent many copies of books to many people, and I don't yet have any reviews, but that's okay. But as a response, I had a call from somebody in the Clarity Coalition inviting me to join, and I was very honored because I saw who the other people were, and I, I read their statement of what they stand for, and I thought it was excellent. So I joined maybe six months ago. I'm a relatively new member. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. 
what exactly is the coalition trying to do and how is it going about it? The coalition apparently took many years to organize because it's difficult to bring together people who are Muslims, ex-Muslims, uh, atheists, Jews, Christians, um, people on all kinds of the political sides of the political spectrum, and to agree to work towards a common goal. And that goal is to advance the rights of women. And as well as other things, my book also deals with problems very clearly associated, such as attacks on free speech, basically attempts to impose Sharia laws on Western freedoms of speech and religion, as well as basic um, undermining of the uh, concept of one law for all, which underpins our entire system here, uh, with the idea of separatist societies, where if you are uh, able to enforce Sharia law, let's say in a divorce case, then you are uh, you're running by a different set of laws. And there, there have been people who have detailed these attempts, and I have, I actually checked them from my own state of Connecticut, well, they and they do exist. Now, in the state of Connecticut, there were a few cases, and the judges simply rejected the arguments. They said, "You're we're in the United States, we're going to use U.S. law," but that doesn't always happen, and it's a problem. Tell me, uh, are people in America or in Europe, why is it that they seem unaware of the problems that India in general and Hindus in particular have faced from more than a thousand years of Islamic invasions and onslaughts? I find total indifference and lack of interest in, in that history, except somebody like Will Durant, who uh, wrote about it extensively. And he has described the Islamic invasions in India as the bloodiest chapter in human history, leading to the death of several hundred million people over that many centuries. But mm -hmm. the Western world seems not just indifferent, but also almost hostile to Hindus who've never harmed anybody. You know, in fact, we find American universities trying to uh, run demonization campaigns against Hindus who've only been at the receiving end and never retaliated. Why is this kind of blind spot so prominent in Western thinking? I'm not sure if I know why. I can, I can think of a couple of possibilities. Uh, looking at my own past, um, I had a slightly unusual education because for several years I was in a private school. And I remember we had one, maybe it was a semester, maybe it was a whole year, uh, split between India and China. And that, in my experience, is extremely unusual in the American school system. So uh, I did know more about India than probably many other people. This was never even included, this history. And I, I have to say as well, um, if you look at how Europeans regard Islam, I've read about it, and it's gone through several cycles in the past, from times when, when Europe was under threat and people had negative views of Islam, the minute the threat went away, everything was uh, reversed. And I don't understand myself why that should be, but that, that does appear to be the way it is. And certainly nobody that I can think of was talking about the fact that there are common characteristics that define uh, what happened in societies, whether it was Eastern Europe, whether it was India, whether it was the Middle East, where, where you know, there were a tremendous number of people uh, hundreds of years later who were not converted to Islam. I can't tell you why that is, but it certainly has been very effective. And one of the things I like about this Clarity Coalition is that it does not stop at regions or continents or borders. 
And I, I'll tell you another uh, another thing that may have some relationship to this. I don't know. When I started to look at this question, I was pretty ignorant about Islam myself. I had heard there were three Abrahamic religions that were like sister religions. And that's how I was raised. It's what I was taught. And I didn't think much about it. And then I went to Bosnia and it was the first time I'd been in a Muslim country and I started to learn more about it. Um, but I think that when I started to work on what was going on in Europe, the first thing I heard was, well, you cannot generalize because the people who have immigrated to Europe come from many different cultures and many different countries and speak many different languages. How can you talk about something like Sharia in any sense that is not so general as to be meaningless? Well, what I observed is that may be, but the problems that were being reported in, in countries from Sweden to Spain were identical. So it came to, I mean, I, I decided to think, well, this has to be a common root. And if you look at the aims and the uh, strategies of, of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, and there are other important groups, similar groups in Europe, you see that there's a common approach. And I decided that that was much more important than whatever cultural traits there may have been, because the young people were growing up without the knowledge of the home country, but they were being exposed to this ideology and they were finding it compelling. So you know, I can just take example, but why, why nobody paid attention to what happened in India, I can't tell you. Not only I, not I paid attention, Leslie, but look at it this way. Apart from nearly a thousand years um, of invasions, from Islamic rule, that's uh, one of the longest histories. And India or Hindus kept fighting back, which is why we survived. Whereas Iran didn't survive, Egypt didn't survive, the entire Middle East uh, succumbed. And large parts of Africa, as we know, succumbed. Some parts of Europe succumbed, but then recovered. But here they ruled also for about 600 years very oppressive, very tyrannical. If as migrants, Islamists are as uh, barbaric in their behavior as they are proving themselves to be in Europe, you can well imagine what they are like when they're rulers. And they rule by the sword. They don't rule by laws. They don't, they, there's, you know, they're above all laws of the land or of humanity. Now, the point is, after all that, after British rule, the British actually helped them divide India and create Pakistan, which wasn't really a nation state, it's never been. It's a launch pad for global jihad. It's a launch pad for terror attacks. It was conceived as a launch pad for uh, expanding jihad. And that's the main purpose of that nation state. And India has faced, I think, the most um, most brutal terror attacks, continuous history of terror attacks coming from Pakistan. But in Western media, in Western academia, what we hear is Hindus are fascists who are trying to crush the Muslim majority. Now look at it this way. They were at the time of partition. I mean, they created a all Muslim state they drove out millions of Hindus from there. My own family came as penniless refugees from what is now Pakistan. But then India was foolish enough to host more Muslims in, pa in India than ever went or lived in what became Pakistan. After they ousted all Hindus, we still said, you're welcome to stay because we are so noble. You know, Gandhi, Nehru, people are now getting so angry about those decisions. The point that I'm trying to say is, despite showing unwarranted generosity, and our constitution gives them more than equal rights. Today, the big complaint of Hindus is at least give them the same rights that Muslims have, Islamists have, as Christians have. And our ruling elites, our government, state machinery is so much under their uh, grip and control that 
we don't get much sympathy. But th this is not a fight that's going to stop anytime soon. But coming to uh, present day, uh, one of the big challenges we face is womb jihad. Some people call it love jihad. I don't think love jihad is the right term. It's about womb jihad. And it's the easiest way to multiply fast if you capture women, seduce women, abduct women from the targeted community and then uh, turn them into sex slaves. They exchange hands, they are put in brothels or uh, made, you know, passed on from one man to the other. Is that a problem in Europe and America as well? I, I have not heard of it yet. Let's put it that way. I don't think it exists in the United States. Um, but in England, there have been inquiries, there have been cases, I believe, Birmingham had uh, thousands of young girls, teenagers, who were, I mean, in England, it's a hot issue. Well, in English, the question, in England, the question of grooming is a very hot issue. But I don't know if that's womb jihad. I think it's more just sexual exploitation. I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't thought this through, but I would say I did not read of womb jihad in my research that doesn't love mean it isn't happening it means i don't know hmm? what about love jihad Sorry? have you heard of the term love jihad what does that mean uh, okay you what you call grooming gangs basically these gangs mm -hmm. are groomed in order to seduce young or not so young women in order to accept sexual relations with one or more men and very often in england or even in europe these girls are then given uh, narcotics and all kinds of drugs so that they become uh, willing victims or or so it would appear they lose the power to resist uh, their exploitation so would you have heard of that in in europe yes and i'm very Sorry that the link did not work for you because I deal with that in my book. It was extensive or is still ongoing, I believe, in the United Kingdom, but it has also occurred in other European countries. So it's not unique to the UK. And I, I did research that. Um, I wrote about it. I think it's very serious. And what is the most serious is that the authorities refuse to address it. And in the UK, what I read was that on the one hand, they didn't want to appear to be Islamophobic or racist. And most of the perpetrators were uh, not native uh, English stock. And second, that many of the girls uh, and young women were from basically broken families, which is why they were vulnerable in the first place. And because they were lower class, they were of less interest to the authorities. I, I just read those things. Those are simply descriptions or allegations that I've read. I have not personally investigated this, but I would find both of them plausible because it's a terrible thing, but we have something going on right now in the United States that I find unbelievable. You know, we have, as you have probably heard, many problems with the open border in the South that was basically yes. created by the Biden administration. And one of the things they did is they dropped a requirement that the previous administration had to check the DNA of incoming children to see if it matched the people they were with. In other words, to stop mm -hmm. the child slavery, if you will, sexual or just in factories. And the kids have been pouring in. And I read reports where they're working in, in sweatshop factories as very small children. Obviously they're being exploited sexually. It's horrifying, it's large numbers. This is not Muslim. So I'm not, you know, I, what I'm trying to say is I think this kind of problem should be tackled regardless of who's involved in it because it's horrible. And I think that there's no excuse. 
whether no matter what color or ethnicity the people are who are involved, it is absolutely inexcusable. Before we go so, any further, can you reduce the headspace and uh, raise your height a little bit because you keep, uh, yeah, disappearing from this. <laughs> this is much better. Yeah. Now, you use the term Islamophobic or Islamophobia. Now, we, I'm sure you're well aware that some states in the U.S. have actually passed laws against Islamophobia. Whereas we better be petrified of Islam, given the ideology, where it's very clear that they mean death for all non-Muslims. That's the mandate of Islam that you have to become a global power. Those who resist Islam have to be either slaughtered or forcibly converted, which is what India went through uh, for centuries. Now, why would any sane person not be afraid of such a religion? Why would not we want to maintain a safe distance from such a religion? And how is it that the ruling establishment in America doesn't realize the threat that Islam poses. Don't they read basic texts of uh, Islam, the Sharia, the Hadith, I mean, the life of the Prophet himself? It's all of it is spine chilling. Why is it that they, they seem oblivious and they target Hindus if we dare speak against it and say enough is enough, you can't continue with it anymore. We've had you for 1,200 years commit unspeakable atrocities and forced conversions and worse. Why is it that the American establishment and its elite universities have been captured by them? Well, it's a lot of questions at once. And if I only answer some, you can remind me of the ones that I skipped. Uh, first of all, if you talk about Islamophobia and you look at the word, a phobia is an irrational fear. I would reject that on the basis. If you, you, can be, you can be afraid or concerned about some of the aspects of Islam that you just mentioned, that's not irrational. So Islamophobia was a charge invented, basically. And I, I read different places where it may have come from, but it emerged around, I don't know, in the 80s. And it's simply a smear term, like uh, you call somebody a racist to shut them up. You call them Islamophobic, you shut them up. And that's the purpose of it. And it's very effective. Now, another point, there was something different in the Sharia treatment of people of the book, Christians and Jews, apart from Hindus. Christians and Jews could submit and be second-class citizens if they didn't want to convert. That was always an option, and it was an option that was uh, accepted or used for hundreds, well, more than a thousand years throughout the Middle East. And I think that one of the the results of that, uh, if you look at the, at the rules that govern these uh, people of the book, they're not allowed to speak against the government. Speaking against the government is grounds for lifting the protections provided to them, which means that you can kill them. So I think that over the years, many Christians, certainly, I mean, there were fewer Jews, but many Christians uh, adapted to that requirement and ended up being uh, very loath to criticize Islam. And of course, they had contacts with people in the West because it's the same religion and there's a sympathy. So I, I have begun to wonder, because I read things in the paper today, there was just a prominent interview by one of our prominent uh, journalists with a fellow, I'd never heard of him, but I understand that he uh, actually has never lived in the Middle East, but he apparently delivered quite a tirade against the Israelis and the Jews. Well, <laughs> Israeli Christians 
and Muslims can live in the state of Israel and they are entitled to the laws of the land. So he obviously is saying something that people said a lot of over the years, doesn't make it true, but it's everywhere. So that's part of the answer. The second, why, uh, let me give you the, my personal experience, um, perhaps a little bit cynical, but anyway, that's what I'm like. The American government is very big it's, and it's getting bigger every day. So there's all these people running around and let, let us assume that they're all trying to do the right thing. I mean, I don't, I don't want to dip into conspiracy theories. Let's assume they're trying to do their best. Well, it's a very confusing environment. It's crazy. You have all these things going on. There's a tremendous amount of power flowing around. And there are so many issues. Let's take foreign policy. Let's take, for example, the war in Ukraine versus the Mideast war. For months, all we had was the war in Ukraine, war in Ukraine, war in Ukraine, war in Ukraine. All of a sudden, you have October 7th, whoop, gone. Ukraine, where? I'm not saying that's I'm for or against what's going on in Ukraine. That's a separate issue, which I'd be happy to discuss sometime. But that shows you, I'm just giving you an example of how difficult it is to fasten on to something. Now, for, for a long time, for like 10 years, it's been obvious that the anti-Semitism on the campuses was really getting out of control. I mean, I saw it because I read about it. And I have any number of Jewish friends with, you know, parents with children. They were oblivious. They, they wanted their kids to have the best. Um, and in many ways, like many Indians I know, they're very focused on education and accomplishments and, and you know, have ambitions in that way, which is very good. So they wanted to get into the best colleges, get the kids the best degrees and get them launched. I understand. But what do you do when your kid has to walk by an Israel apartheid week every year? And now, of course, it's advanced to physical attacks on Jewish students. Of course. What did you expect? They expected nothing. This has been a big wake-up call, which I take as a positive. And then you say, oh, how about that? Look at all the money from places like Qatar going to the universities. I wonder if there's a connection. Well, whoop de do. I mean, years ago, it was Saudi Arabia. They gave, what, $10 million to Harvard. You do the math. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. this is not hard. Nobody was paying attention. And I'm, I'm trying not to be snide. I'm just trying to say that people are very... Uh, they get distracted. They have other things that come up. We have all kinds of other domestic problems that really are nonpartisan, such as spending far beyond our means and the current inflation and, and, and other problems that keep people racing around just to keep, keep themselves together. So I've made all the excuses I can. I wrote my book in hopes of at least doing my best to raise these issues to other Americans. I used European examples because they were more visible and widespread. But my final chapter deals with the with what's going on in the US and it, it is not pretty. And you see that the people related to Muslim Brotherhood have established wonderful connections in the federal US government. Yes, absolutely. As well. It wouldn't be long done before the, the I sorry. Please finish. Well, same thing happened. It's okay. Same thing happened at the EU, and the reason I write in my book about the EU and the US is that if you want to establish Sharia, you must have government force to enforce it. Government control. It's not going to happen uh, autonomously, and therefore you go at any level of government. But I chose the two top ones because. A decision made at the EU is binding throughout the EU. Same thing for the US federal government. So it's a big win. So True. the Islamists are not, are they're not dumb, they're smart. And so it's a good yeah. strategy for them. 
we need to see it and capture it. No, it's it's not just you know the tragedy even in India yeah. is that lot of elite minds used to think oh they are not so well educated they uh, are doing menial jobs they have no idea how Islamists whether they are rich or poor educated or uneducated they're thinking 500 years ahead and their agenda is always uh, ahead of everything else it comes before their personal interest which is global domination of Islam they have to make sure that the entire world turns Islamic and India is the prime target. They call it Ghazwai Hind. It's a mission to convert all of India fully into an Islamic uh, zone. Uh, they could only take a part of India in 1947 partition. But, you know, many would say, number one, this Islamophobic uh, nonsense that they have used as a shield, a protective shield, for themselves is typical of this whole concept of al taqiya the seat which is ingrained in the way they spread islam which is play victim card whether you read the life of the prophet peace be upon him or you read um, the quran or you read um, any of their um, uh, uh, you know hadith or any other text one thing is very shocking for most of us who are used to uh, being, um, who used to believing that you don't cheat, you don't lie, that uh, honesty uh, ought to be a, an integral part of your existence. I'm sure as good Christians are also taught that. But here they're taught to use deceit play victim card you kill someone and then you play victim uh, play the victim card which is what palestinians have done for so long they're not willing to live at peace with anyone anywhere and yet there are victims everywhere they will attack you they will decimate you they will commit all kinds of barbarities and i think one of the most offensive doctrines of islam is this concept of male ganimat i'm sure you know which is that all the women you capture either in war or abduct uh, are your property to do what you like with them. You cut them up in pieces or you put them in brothels so you do what you like with them. And yet, feminists in particular in my country, especially those who are part of global networks, are all pro-Islam. All those funded by European donor agencies or the Ford Foundation, etc. They're all pro-Islam. They're all pro-Sharia. When there is talk of reforming Muslim personal law, they rise in revolt against the Indian state and they call Hindu fascists by saying Sharia does horrible things to women and therefore Muslim personal law needs to be fixed. They won't have any of it. The leftists the feminists, the so-called liberals, um, they've all turned pro-Islamic. So the victim card uh, strategy works beautifully, uh, both with leftists and, and, of course, with Islamists. I think they uh, feed on each other. But many would call what's happening to Europe in particular reverse colonialism, except that this is not through war, this is not uh, to come as uh, rulers to begin with, but to come as poor immigrants, to create a crisis in the home country, then to come as refugees, and then slowly, through demographic invasion, you keep increasing your numbers. So many would say, well, Europe did it to so many countries, they colonized and they exploited, they bled them, and now it's Payback time. This is reverse colonialism. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, I think that for many people, many Europeans, it is a powerful argument. Um, and I'm not, well, I'm an American, so I we have our own colonial past. Um, 
I found one thing I found very interesting. I worked for a while in Brussels for a British company, and it took me a while to understand when Americans say colonial, it's only positive. Oh, the colonial times, colonial houses, colon it's a positive. When a British person says it, it's derogatory. Oh, those colonials. <laughs> so mm. it's, I, I would say that I don't, um, I don't, I've, I know some of the history of European colonial empires and I can understand that people would today feel guilty about what happened. I mean, you can take Belgium where they chopped the arms off people and the feet. I mean, horrible things. But two wrongs don't make a right. That's point number one. I agree. And, and point number two, the United States is very different. We are a nation of immigrants. Um, we could talk at length about America's imperial activities, and I would probably be a little bit, well, quite critical for reasons that are a little different from other people's. But the bottom line is people have always wanted to come. There has often been resistance. I mean, I have a friend who's part Irish, and when she grew up in the 30s in eastern Connecticut, uh, the mothers on the street wouldn't let her play with her with their girls because she was Irish. Ew, you know, third class. Well, that's gone by. The Italians had the same problem. Eastern Europeans had the, the Jews had the same problem, but it goes by. And so immigrants who come here may struggle at the start, and I don't want to downplay that, but they they have known up till now that if they work hard, their kids will can be American for, for, and, and get out of it whatever they can get and, and enjoy the, the fruits of such a society. But it really depends on obeying the law because that's all we have. We don't have an ethnicity. We don't have a religion. We don't have a this, we don't have a that. We have a constitution and we have laws and we have an English language, which by the way, um, I was in Germany in the early 80s, and I think at that time, an equal number of Americans were of English and German descent. It's interesting to think about, isn't it? <laughs> and you look back at World War One, where World War II, where the, the Germans were actually quite, they weren't off the, the wall to hope that Germans in the United States would be sympathetic to their positions, just for reasons, cultural reasons. So you have this group of people and, mm. and that's, that has to be the basis, but they cannot come and transform us. And that's what they're trying to do. Now, America has been transformed by these past waves. I mean, it started off that if you were a Jew or a Catholic, there was something wrong with you. That, that has changed. I'm sure that the first Hindus who came here were looked on as at best as strange people, but you get used to it, you know? So it, it, it's that kind of a society, but it doesn't, it, it's not evolving away from its roots when it's evolving like that. And what the Islamists want to do is transform away from the roots. Now, I would say we also have a progressive movement here that also would like to transform America away from its roots. And you're right, there is a sympathy and a cooperation. And your comments about feminists completely ignoring any women's problems associated with, with Sharia is absolutely correct. Could not be more sure. correct. To me, it is okay. appalling. I'm going to um, bring some of quotations from uh, your uh, articles about, you know, the European experience. Uh, in one of your papers, you talk about no-go zones growing in Europe. Well, in India, we call them mini Pakistans, where not mm. only Hindus don't dare go, there are many around my house where I live, but even the police will not dare go in because you don't know if you will come out one piece. And uh, if something happens to you there, um, you know, very often even 
delivery boys for parcels will not go courier boys because they are afraid that if slightest tussle takes place over something they may not come back alive this is serious problems now no go zones that you talk about here a senior german police commissioner reported that there were areas where the power of the state is completely out of the picture in 2010 the police union in north rhine brought in turkish police to help control turkish populations in major cities and french government now posts online a list of more than 750 zones or no go zones where an estimated 5 million muslims live tourists and non muslims are urged to avoid these areas over which the french state has lost control you speak in the same language about netherlands united kingdom where they are actually demanding sharia rule and in many pockets only sharia applies in brussels the muslim ghettos are becoming dangerous for non muslims as well as for women who venture into the cafes or date non muslims now uh, how is it that uh, these powerful states have fallen so fast this when they are a minority 5% minority 6% how is it that they are so timid what uh, what causes such timidity i'm not sure i really know the answer uh i think that um i think that there is a a basic timidity a fear again of being labeled Uh, a bad person, a racist, for even talking about this. Uh, again, I'm very sorry you couldn't see my book because I put a whole chapter to this, updating it. Mm. So it has only gotten worse, um, and there have been efforts by governments to they they recognize that there's a problem, but it's one thing to recognize the problem and another thing to do something about it. I think it was. I always forget things once I write them down. It was about maybe ten years ago. Sarkozy was the um, president in France, and uh, Merkel was in Germany. And I guess it was—I don't remember who it was in the UK. All three of them came out against multiculturalism. So they obviously they they made different points, but they had. made it clear that they saw that this just was a failed concept and it was dangerous. Well that was then and this is now. So even when the guys at the top perceive a problem. Now Macron has the the current French president has uh tried to do some things about it, but stuff gets watered down and he falls into a very common trap. Uh which is to say well if we had french islam and we could control who the who the imams were that taught here then it would be okay well what you're doing is you're providing the perfect organizational structure to be completely taken over by the muslim brotherhood if not from the start then shortly thereafter he doesn't get it and one of the things that i feel so strongly about here is We love multiculturalism too, which is simply wrong. We are a society of many cultures, but we should value only the individual from each culture, not the cultures themselves. You start having communities, and then you're broken up, and that's what Europe has done. No, but Leslie, India is a great example. Thousands of years, millennia of long history of multiculturalism. dozens of languages each with its own script and its own great literature great classics uh any number of uh, deities we worship i mean we don't even believe in one god in one form who can be worshiped only in one way you can believe in anything you can be an atheist and yet be a hindu you can be a bodh you can be a jain so many uh 
dharmic groups or religious, we don't call them religion, uh, thrived here. So many food, so many dress, uh, I mean, attires. Every region has its own attire, its own food habits, its own family system, all that. But the West never liked it. They hated our multiculturalism. It was thriving because no community ever tried to impose its rules or regulations on anyone within the same village. You would have different communities follow different patterns and nobody ever said, you better fo follow mine. But this is something they destroyed. The British destroyed the Portuguese. Whoever came here as colonial rulers, they destroyed to the best of their ability. They, they hated it. The point that I'm trying to make is multiculturalism is okay so long as no one has the right to say my way or the highway. If you don't follow my way, then you deserve to be slaughtered. You don't deserve to survive on this planet. So uh, if you say there has to be one way, which is the American way, they'll say, but what's wrong with our way? I would say if they want their way, by all means, but keep it to yourself. Don't dare impose it on others. Behave yourself. That's the limit. They, that's not what Islamists do. And I think that's really what the disease is. Now, there's another chapter of yours or a, a paper of yours I read. And it, it talks about how much they're draining off the European economies. One low rate of employment among Muslim immigrants. They don't, they, do they not want to take up jobs or they don't get jobs? What's the story? Oh, I'm not sure I really know the story, but I operate on the assumption <clears throat> that if you have extensive social welfare benefits available upon arrival in the country, you can assure yourself of a low uptake on the job market. We're, we're experiencing that here with all of these millions of what I call illegal aliens, because that's what they are, who've come across the border. I worked for a while, many, many years ago, as a consular officer. I wouldn't give a tourist visa unless the person demonstrated that they would not be a financial charge on the United States while they were in the United States. It's in our law. So now we have these people coming in who we don't even know who they are and we give them all the stuff. And and you expect good to come of that? I don't think so. <laughs> so no, I think I, that um, you also have people coming in. Look, one of the differences when I researched it between the United States and and Europe is of course geographical in the sense that Europe needed a lot of basic uh, manual labor after World War II, and they started importing people from the Maghreb and Turks. And these were people who were not particularly educated. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that their children wouldn't be educated, but they, if you look at the people who came to the United States, Muslims, many of them were middle class and they prospered. In fact, one time when I looked at the average income of um, the Muslim population was higher than that of the white population. So part of it is who comes in and what their expectations are and what the rules are. And if you are in a situation which exists now in many European countries where you go back to the homeland, you take some young girl who's a cousin, you import her into Europe, marry her, get her pregnant, keep her home. She's the, she's the uh, servant of the mother-in-law and she has babies. Well, what do you think is going to come of that? I mean, and, and when I talk, I will make one, one comment. With regard to multiculturalism, what I'm talking about is a current theory that says all cultures are, <clears throat> are the same. And the second corollary of that is European culture is worse than all the others. They don't say that part out loud the first time, but it's there. And that has very little to do with the kind of coexistence that you described. 
And in fact, in the US, yes, you can't be, you can't live below the law, but a lot of people, a lot of, of Islamists refer, for example, to Orthodox Jews who have their own laws. I have never heard of Orthodox Jews living in a way that required them to break US law. They have to live above the, 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 the floor of the law. <clears throat> they can't live below it. Below it means you don't have, you don't give people their rights. So, and they don't, they do what they do to meet the requirements. Let's come to the social benefits part because they come and they land with a reasonable amount of money that's coming to them for doing nothing. Now, we also know very well that this is part of well thought out strategy that Islamists will create a crisis in the home country, as in, say, Afghanistan. Suddenly it looked like, oh, my God, we are endangered and people are fleeing because Taliban has come over and the Afghanis will flee or they will flee from Syria or whatever. But the moment they land in Europe or any other country, they want to create another Afghanistan there. They want to create another Islamic enclave there. They don't leave behind the source of their uh, tyranny or what they said was tyranny that forced them to escape their homeland. So it seems to me that these are engineered crises to play on our emotional heartstrings, to show those poor, hapless children and women with children marching alone and looking for shelter. You know, people who, are, who seem to ha have no home, they have been driven out of homeland. And then, of course, we say, how can we refuse shelter? The Rohingyas have done that in India. And then they become uh, a real security threat wherever they are. The Bangladeshi Muslims have done that. And we have, of course, perhaps the largest number of illegal immigrants. Now, Indian state is pampering them no less uh, at great cost. But Germany, I mean, the figures you give, these are perhaps old ones, estimated 40% of Muslim youth in France and 50% in Germany are unemployed but not destitute. They immediately start getting uh, state aid. And more importantly, here Sweden, the figures are outrageous. Estimated immigrants are estimated at 1.5 million out of 10 million people. Immigration is estimated to cost almost $14 billion per year. Now, are Swedes mad or what? They don't realize the implications of it. They don't oh, the, read Islam. The, the Swedes, uh, I, I'll be a little hazy about this because I'm not an expert on Swedish politics, but some years ago, the two major parties, right and left, Got, the de got together and did a compact to ensure that the party that was highlighting these problems with immigration could not enter the government for the foreseeable future. Now, it looks to me as if that didn't work out so well because the pressures got so great. But I was just reading the other day, uh, you take the incidence of rape in Sweden. Yeah. It has skyrocketed. Yeah. And when... The and, and it happened in Germany as well. And there were cases where like a female judge would say, well, maybe girls, you know, young women should go out together or, or not after dark. I mean, it's incredible. It's really incredible. And I think, um, I don't know to what degree uh, lack of imagination plays a part or whether it's cowardice or what, I don't know. But the longer you don't, the longer you go out in front of the worse it gets. I, I agree with that. But I really think that feminism took this slogan, my body, my right, too far. And as a result, young women have been encouraged to indulge in very high risk behavior. Their dating patterns. And, you know, at 13, 14, 15, you're dating strangers. And it's expected that when you date, you will sleep with the man. 
you don't really know him and then going to all these rave parties you know where drugs and liquor are flowing these are very irresponsible ways to use your body I, or i mean your I, body my body my right but whose responsibility and i think that's a question that feminists fail to answer then you can't run to the police if i'm the kind of person who at age 14 or 15 was attending all night parties getting drunk with strangers and getting you know uh, also taking drugs and having one night stands or whatever or even three night stands then if horrible things happen to me i have to be able to stand up and say i will take responsibility for my irresponsible behavior and my body i mean we consider in 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 the hindu ethos you know this is you have to treat it like temple because it's the abode of the divine and you have to take responsibility for it you can't throw it around like that so my body my right and and teenage sex and being considered abnormal if you're not doing it i think these are things that need to be reviewed what would you say to that i think you and i are from the same generation <laughs> i mean i i think it's such destructive behavior that it can't continue i mean i i remember being horrified i have i don't have children of my own i have a number of nieces and nephews and i was helping my sister um take care of her two nieces who were in high school and i was reading at the time this is 10 15 years ago about the hookup culture yeah. where a girl simply has sex because she meets a guy and he wants it and i thought my golly at least prostitutes get paid yeah i mean what has exactly. gone wrong fine and then and then yeah. lo and behold the girl leaves college and she stops the behavior yes because she didn't enjoy it at all it was peer pressure that put her into it in the first place she didn't have the wherewithal mentally to resist and what how can you do that to yourself i mean to to my mind i i think they're all nuts but of course i never was i i have always been a feminist in the sense that i think women have equal rights with men i entered a field that at the time was largely male dominated that didn't bother me at all if it, if my presence bothered them that was their problem uh, i think women should have many opportunities i think in terms of divorce law and things is very important that they have rights i'm in favor of all of that but i am not a feminist because i don't accept all the other nonsense okay we come back I, I to want, this i want the next yeah. g now we come back to the immigrant issue uh i i'm still referring to your european uh experience papers because i didn't get to read your book i just couldn't download it now coming back I'm to sorry. this I, well i i i'll read it i'll find a way of getting hold of it um if you have a soft copy and if you could just mail it to me that be good otherwise i'll try to download it whatever it takes anyway coming back to this um uh, apart from the fact that social welfare funds are going to these immigrants who are coming doing nothing but parasiting on the land they migrate to in large numbers and multiplying rapidly as part of well planned demographic invasion but i was shocked to read from your uh, from this paper that prominent islamist imams like even terrorists are getting state funding uh welfare funding that i mean that they don't bother about these security measures india doesn't but i thought europe would be smarter you gave some examples that even when european governments have begun to move against prominent individuals engaged in advancing the islamist cause which essentially means conversions islamic jihad and all the rest of it prominent islamist imams like abu katada collect social benefits from the uk government while fighting deportation 
and when Belgium authorities finally arrested internet jihadis like Malika El Raut, she was still getting $1,100 per month in unemployment benefits. So you're paying them to be full-time jihadis. And the family of jihadi John, you say, who's an ISIS member, famed for his beheadings of Western hostages, got social uh, welfare benefits for 20 long years. What kind of state machinery are we dealing with? Have they, has it been completely subverted and um, become so ineffective just facing with um, these terrorists, determined terrorists? Well, I wrote my book in part to try to draw attention to this. If you take the U.S. government, <clears throat> and one part of my book, I list some of the programs where federal taxpayer money is going to promote Islamist activities and causes. What are we thinking? What is going on? I mean, I, again, I don't think you should uh, underestimate um, the ignorance in many parts, because this doesn't appear in the media, so people don't know about it. Okay, once that my point is, I I have a confidence that once people know about it, they'll respond, and in many cases they will. Uh, but your media doesn't cover. Thing, it's more busy bashing well, into the, the media. The media is the, the mainstream media is the propaganda arm of the Democratic National Committee. It's just what they are. You can tell because um, I used to, you know, they get the talking points each morning. You see them saying the identical phrase. Well, they must have got a memo on the email. <laughs> Say this today. <laughs> I mean, they're pathetic. They don't even hide it. But there are many alternative sources. That's where I. That's what I use. If I relied on the Washington Post and the New York Times, I wouldn't have anything to write about. So stuff yeah. leaks out and there are many alternatives and people are listening but the problem is that the audiences are now segregated there's a big flap mm -hmm. going on this week about national public um npr national public radio i guess it is but they are funded by the u.s government to some degree and the idea was somebody had the bright idea, which was wrong, that if the government uh, helped, there would be a an independent or uh, nonpartisan voice. Well, the, the new CEO is a woman who doesn't even have journalistic experience, but she's way over in the progressive camp. I mean, way she no longer she believes Not that um, things like this. This hmm? is fascist. You can't call it progressive. No, no. You you have to call them fascist. This is Islam of fascism. I, yes, but no this less. isn't just Islam. Sorry, the reason I'm saying progressive, this is not, she's not a Muslim. This is... You don't have to be a Muslim in order... See, the left and at least from the experience of India, I can tell you, the left and the Islamists have been hands in glove with each other from the word go. And therefore, yep. when the left calls itself progressive, but supports Islam, which is which is actually a, an ideology which is far more ferocious than, than Hitler's uh, Nazi ideology. It was at least targeted at one point. Huh? They, they hate... Christianity and Judaism because people believe in God, but the God that they want to support is a much more powerful and, um, shall we say, yeah. dangerous. Well, I think, first of all, I don't want to, I may disagree with you on this point, but I really do want to point out that I have been careful in my writing to focus on Islamists because who is the largest number of people they've slaughtered to date? other Muslims. And I believe that there are, there are people, I've read books written by them in Europe, 
Muslim people who are horrified by what's going on. There are some very prominent um, Muslims in the United Kingdom who have led the charge. So I do think I, I like to make the difference because I think it's so unfair to those brave souls not to highlight their courage and their intelligence and their and, and their dedication. But I think that um, when I say progressive, yeah, I, 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 my, my point is progressing to what? And nobody has ever described to me what this nirvana is that they're progressing towards <laughs> because it's yeah. probably too horrifying to discuss. Yeah, but you see, in some ways, Islam gives you very little choices. If you have to be a good Muslim, you have to do all the things that Taliban and ISIS demand of you. So actually, and they don't allow any exit. This is one religion which says you deserve death if you dare exit. Last question. You talk also about the role of the European Union and its court of justice. Um, how it has tried to blur the distinction between EU citizens and foreigners, working diligently to expand the social benefits that today underpin Muslim ghettos and lawless zones. Is there something similar happen happening in America? What CJEU has done? Absolutely. I mean, the, again, this is, not, this is not directed at Muslims. But if you take this question of the, what is it, eight or 10 million people streaming across the border. And if you look at pictures of them, by the way, they're not poor. They're not mm. desperate. They're well fed. They're dressed like everybody else. The way they walk, you can tell that they have plenty of energy. They're young. A lot of them are young, single males of military age, something like 40,000 from China. I mean, what is going on? But they are... There's a big pressure, uh, and I just read something in the paper yesterday. People are trying to round them up to uh, get them signed up to vote. Now, in the United States, you must be a U.S. citizen to vote in the federal election. There hmm. are cases in local elections where you can be a legal resident, but you have to hmm. be a citizen to vote. Hmm. And they're trying to sign these people up. Why? Because they're going to vote for Biden. I mean, it. It's very simple. You look at them. Some of them are saying it before they even come in. We, we want Biden because we want to get in because he's going to give us all this free stuff. <laughs> so this is um, a I don't know what and I don't want to speculate on the motivations of the European Court of Justice. I believe that there are people who simply are naive enough not to understand the the mentality of people who can just get benefits and come. I don't know why they're so naive, but I, I let's assume they are. There's in India, no question. Uh, no, Leslie, would be in, in, India, in India, uh, Leslie, we find that a lot of people who are compromised, whether they are in the bureaucracy or in the judiciary or in the media or academia, who become the foot soldiers of Islamists, uh, who defend them more ably than they themselves defend themselves, are usually bought over because they have deep pockets. Uh, petrodollar Islam, mm -hmm. zakat funds. It's, it's a very wealthy global community now. So it isn't just naivety, yeah. but they can actually um, benefit your career. Your, career really flies high. Look what they did to Trump. I mean, that an American president would be hounded the way he has been uh, was beyond imagination. And his main uh, crime has been that he wasn't generous towards them. And Biden, who looks to me at least like a walking, talking cadaver, is their favorite. That's the kind of um, rubber stamp they want. Um, they've subverted universities, they've subverted the, uh, the uh, security establishment, foreign policy establishment. So it can't just be naivety. It has to be also their money power and their ability to benefit your careers. Those of us who have taken on Islam pay a heavy price with regard to our academic careers. Yeah. 
I once wrote a paper on the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States and its anti-Semitism. And I did it at the request of an, of a, an organization uh, that combated anti-Semitism. It lasted a week on their website before it was pulled down. Two oh. of the major donors had apparently threatened that if the if the fellow um, had not just my my work but work of other people talking about Islamic anti-Semitism, that they would no longer support him. And I, <laughs> it, it's incredible. So I I am very aware of this and. Um, all I can say is you have to have confidence, which believe it or not, I still do, that the average person, and I speak here just for Americans because that's who I really know, when you really see what's going on, you do something about it. Remember, we're a country of the Second Amendment. Second Amendment allows people to carry firearms. It is constantly under attack from the left. Um, but the bottom line, I didn't understand for years the importance of it. I don't own a gun myself. I mean, I know how to shoot, but I, I don't personally own a weapon. But um, it's a mentality. And the mentality is, if need be, I will defend myself and my family and my property, period. I will do it. And I know lots of people, particularly in the community where I live, yeah, this is their attitude. And I, I'll end with what Ronald Reagan used to say. What are the most, the nine most frightening words? I'm here from the, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Mm. Okay, one more so final question. Yeah, that is so true. That's so true. Mm. But then today you are saddled with the Biden. Uh, last question. It obviously seems that one of the main uh, wellsprings of this generosity towards immigrants is particularly from the Islamic world. I don't know why they don't allow people from other parts of the world come in uh, who uh, don't carry this ideological baggage. But it's because of labor shortage. And labor shortage because um, there's for rapid fertility decline. Um, women are not even willing to have one child anymore. It started with max two children, then it came to one, and no, better not have, better to live with dogs than with children. Now, if that continues, there is no way Europe can survive. And there is no way if you have to Im keep importing, or America, if you have to keep importing labor and you prefer to import from those part of, parts of the world, which are actually committed to wiping you out from the surface of the earth, there's no chance. So feminism in that sense, you know, has actually come to be a millstone round the neck of its own societies. Because for military, people aren't willing to, in, people in Germany, people in America, people in um, France aren't willing to send their children or children aren't willing to go to the military. There's only one child family. You don't want them to go die in someone else's war. Um, so you're recruiting them in the army and they can subvert your defense if they get into the armed forces in large numbers. You need them as uh, caretakers for the elderly population. You need them as labor to run your factories and your uh, other support services. Uh, so is this a viable way to live? Has feminism not actually done a lot of harm by demeaning child produce, you know, reproductive functions um, women as homemakers, if you demean it so much and you think the only dignified way to live for a woman is to have a job outside, which means um, children are a burden. Doesn't feminism need to, you don't think this needs to be rethought and reviewed, this attitude? Well, the attitude is widespread and it does correlate 
exposure, which is happening here in the United States, in our demographic profile is not as bad as Europe's, but there's a real problem. And I agree with you. I mean, in my family, um, my sister and my sisters-in-law, and, and now another one, all wanted to have children. They also worked. The children came first. I will tell you what is most important to them. Absolutely first is the children. That's their life and not the other way around. So I really don't even understand these other people. But I will close with one example of a, an industrial country that probably has plenty of feminists in it that does not have this problem. The state of Israel. They have, yeah. I don't know what's happening since October 7th, but they had a constantly increasing fertility rate in a post-industrial, highly democratic very literate society. So you say to yourself, what's the difference? And what I have read is the sense of purpose, community, identity, and the desire to help with the future. We don't have those things. I'll tell you what, it's an open door for anybody to walk in, whether it's 40,000 Chinese young men who turn out to be, to have some kind of plan because after all, they got visas from the Chinese government, didn't they? Or it's yeah. Islamists or whoever. I, I think the problem lies with the West. And once you have a firm understanding of your own future and the benefit that you derive from your family and your, your religion, because this is often very closely tied to religion. Religion yes. gives you something different than yourself and some kind of concept of why you're there and what you're doing. Uh, if we don't yeah. have that, we're done. True. Yeah, basically, family as an institution and valuing the role of women as reproducers of the race. If you don't value that, and women start devaluing it themselves, uh, well, then uh, the human race disappears. And I wouldn't mind the human race as a whole disappearing, but certainly not under onslaught from Islam. Uh, certainly not demographic invasion by Islamists. I think that's the most frightening scenario. And we are, I think, on the same page on most issues. Thank you very much, Leslie, for coming on our program. A lot of people have asked for links to your book, and we are providing them in the description. And I will try to read your book at the earliest. Um, enjoyed reading, not enjoyed, um, but learned a lot from your art that I read, um, they're, they're, they're very worrisome. I mean, you know, we in India tend to be bogged down by our own problems emanating from demographic invasion and daily attacks, daily attacks, daily acts of subversion. Uh, today, one doesn't feel safe in, uh, in the land I live. My parents came as penniless refugees from what is now Pakistan. And we're beginning to feel now, uh, where will we go now once uh, they, their uh, well-publicized agenda of full Islamization of India by 2047? They've even set a date, 2047, 100 years after the partition, the bloody partition, which rendered millions homeless. So... Uh, it's a frightening scenario, but I hope if Europe and America wake up, then uh, it will be easier for us in other parts of the world who are equally or more endangered to make common cause. There's plenty of reason for us to make common cause. And I wish your coalition all the very best. And uh, I assure you, you can count on our support in any way we can be of help in spreading the message and in lending strength to your voices. Well, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure to appear. Thank you, Leslie. And good night and all the very best. Okay, viewers, aap ne suna Leslie ko, dekh lijiye kya hal ho raha Europe aur America ka bhi. 
इनकी किताब जरूर पढ़िए लिंक हमने प्रोवाइड कर दिया है जैसा आपने कहा था इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ शुभ रात्रि और वंदे मातरम पर हाँ हाँ एक बात बताना भूल गई ये जो पिटिशन हमने की है यूएन को आ, वो जिन लोगों ने इनिशिएट की है जिसके हम बहुत से सिग्नेटरीज हैं उस पे चर्चा हम बहुत जल्दी करेंगे राहुल सूर के साथ और क्योंकि इनिशिएटिव उन्हीं का था और हम बहुत सारे लोग उसके साथ जुड़ गए तो राहुल को भी बहुत जल्दी लेके आएंगे उस पिटिशन के बारे में बताने की हालांकि जैसा यूएन में होता है अगर इस्लामिस्ट करते हैं कोई पिटिशन तो तुरंत सुनवाई हो जाती है अब हमारी पिटिशन की होगी नहीं होगी कितनी होगी पर हम कोशिश तो अवश्य करेंगे और हमारी वेबसाइट पे मैं सारी वो पिटिशन पोस्ट कर दूंगी अगले प्रोग्राम से पहले जब ये यूएन की पिटिशन पे हम बात करेंगे ये पहली बार हुआ है कि इस्लाम के बारे में सवाल या निशान उठाते हुए जो पिटिशन गई है यूएन को इस पे जरूर तवज्जो दीजिएगा और बहुत जल्दी आप वेबसाइट पे भी देखेंगे और उस पर एक दो और चर्चा भी करेंगे और उसके जो प्रोमिनेंट सिग्नेटरीज हैं उनसे जरूर बात करेंगे हम उन्होंने क्यों साइन की अलग अलग देशों से इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ आप सबका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद एक सुपर चैट आया है कहाँ गई शुक्ला जी की जी जरा ले आइए मिसिज लेबू हु यू डेंट लर्न हिंदी लैंग्वेज एज कैप्टन विलियम अ मिलिट्री मेंबर ड्यूरिंग ब्रिटिश रूल लर्न वेरी वेल ड्यूरिंग मंगल पांडे टाइम वेल बहुत उन्हें बहुत सी लैंग्वेजेस आती हैं पर हम uh, अभी तक uh, बहुत लोगों के जहन में नहीं है शुक्ला जी वो भी बदलेगा दिन कभी ऐसा लगता है मुझे आ, पर अगर हम अपनी भाषाओं को सीरियसली लेंगे तो दुनिया भी लेगी हम ही भूलना चाहते हैं हम ही अंग्रेजी के दीवाने जब हो रहे हैं तो बाहर के लोग क्यों हमारी भाषाएं सीखेंगे है ना हमें अपनी भाषाओं की तरफ सम्मानजनक रवैया अपनाना पड़ेगा तभी बाकी लोग भी सीखेंगे शुभ रात्रि वंदे मातरम सी यू अगेन वेरी सुन ये मुझे कहना